But I never will forget one night very late. It was around midnight. And you can have some strange experiences at midnight. The telephone started ringing and I picked it up. On the other end was an ugly voice. That voice said to me in substance, Nigger, we are tired of you and your mess now. And if you aren't out of this town in three days, we're going to blow your brains out and blow up your house. I had heard these things before, but for some reason that night it got to me. I turned over and I tried to go to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. It was frustrated. Bewildered. Then I got up and went back to the kitchen and I started warming some coffee, thinking that coffee would give me a little relief. Then I started thinking about many things. I pulled back on the theology and philosophy that I had just studied in the universities trying to give philosophical and theological reasons for the existence and the reality of sin and evil. But the answer didn't quite come there. I sat there and thought about a beautiful little daughter who had just been born about a month earlier. We have four children now, but we only had one then. She was the darling of my life. I'd come in night after night and see that little gentle smile. I sat at that table thinking about that little girl and thinking about the fact that she could be taken away from any minute. And I started thinking about a dedicated, devoted, and loyal wife who was over there asleep. She could be taken from me. I could be taken from her. And I got to the point that I couldn't take it any longer. I was weak. Something said to me, you can't call on daddy now. He's up in Atlanta, 175 miles away. You can't even call on mama now. You've got to call on that something and that person that your daddy used to tell you about. That power that can make a way out of nowhere. I discovered then that religion had to become real to me and I had to know God for myself. And I bowed down over that cup of coffee. I never will forget it. Oh, yes, I prayed a prayer and I prayed out loud that night. I said, Lord, I'm down here trying to do what's right. I think I'm right. I think the cause that we represent is right. But Lord, I must confess that I'm weak now, I'm faltering, I'm losing my courage. I can't let the people see me like this because if they see me weak and losing my courage, they will begin to get weak. Seemed that that moment that I could hear an inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness. Stand up for justice. Stand up for truth. And lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. I tell you, I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roll. I felt sin breakers passing, trying to conquer my soul. But I heard the voice of Jesus saying, still to fight on. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone.
alone. Promise never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. I'm going on in believing in him. You better know him and know his name. Know how to call his name. Don't be a fool. Recognize your dependence on God. So if you guys don't know me at all, I am a uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, fan. Um, I love everything about the man, what he did, what he stood for. Um, I researched so much into Martin Luther King Jr.'s life. And uh, when you have a man that stands up in, in the adversity that he had to stand up in, and still have the courage to move forward, even with the family and children and the things that he had, uh, or the things that he did. Um, it is astounding to me. And he did it all, did it all with preaching the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, that's exactly how he did it, was preaching the kingdom of God. And um, uh, this, this portion of audio that you heard uh, from a speech that he gave, um, technically it was a sermon that he gave, was the moment that he got his calling. The moment that he got his purpose. Now it's funny that we call it a calling because he literally had somebody call him up. I don't know if you caught the beginning of the audio, but somebody called him up and told him that he's going to kill his family, blow up his house if he doesn't leave. And he took that moment and he got courage from it. And this is one of the things that he said uh, from it. I find it fascinating. He says, you've got to call on that something, uh, that something. In that person that your daddy used to tell you about. That power that can make a way out of no way. I discovered then that religion had to become real to me. And I had to know God for myself. At that moment, I could hear that inner voice saying to me, Martin Luther, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and I will be with you. Amen? Amen. And I love that because it's a calling, a purpose, which we all have. I was thinking about um, uh, 2020, and I, I was sitting back thinking about um, uh, the, the next thing, because obviously we're moving into the new year, um, and at our church we, we do these series, and we're talking about uh, moving into a series. What kind of series will we move into um, right now? And, and I was thinking about it, and, I, and as I was thinking about it and praying through it, um, I was also getting ready um, for a staff retreat. And at the staff retreat, one of the things that the Lord kept talking to me about was this concept of, of basically uh, pivoting. And I decided it was super weird because I don't play basketball. And that's the only thing I ever knew of a pivot was from basketball, like, right? Like, you can't do it because if you don't know how to pivot, then you're going to travel and everybody's going to be mad at you. Like, that's just the way it works, right? And so it was this basketball term that I was like, pivoting, I don't, I don't understand. And, and I started researching this, this idea of the pivot. And uh, we went up to the retreat and I told my staff that we need to learn how to pivot. And, and, and what does pivoting look like? And the staff kind of got all excited about it. And they were like, that should be our next series is teaching us how to pivot. And I want to share a little bit about uh, pivoting, if I can. Is that okay? I'm not a basketball coach. But I want, to, I want to give you guys this idea of why we need to learn to pivot. The reason we need to learn to pivot is because we hate change. Oh, it's, it's a huge, let's just be real. Most of you don't even have change in your pocket right now. You hate it so much. Okay? We don't like change at all. I mean, change is it, it, it's just part of what naturally occurs in life. But at the end of the day, we just don't like change. No, and, and let's just be real. If we're really looking at it, it's like, oh, just, can I give a real life moment of how to explain change, right? The reason I know that we don't like change, especially in here, is because you come every Sunday and sit in the exact same seat 
without fail. Majority, like I know who's here and not here because I'm like, oh, that seat's empty, right? And then when newcomers come, they're, you're like, oh, they sat in my seat. And it's that moment, what do I do? Yep. <laughs> what do I do? Do I just get really close to them and be like, what's up? And it's like, you know, or do, you, you know, or do I make the case, hey, can I sit there? Like, you would never do that, right? But the reality becomes, we don't like change. And the reason we don't like change is because we are creatures of habit. And the reason that we're creatures of habit is this. We are a being that is not just physical, but we're also spiritual and basically emotional, right? And so what happens is, is the seat that you found... The seat that you found, you probably had a good time with God in that seat. And therefore, I love this seat because God's in this seat. <laughs> now, if you're like, don't like that example, okay? But let's be real. You're probably thinking of a moment and you're like, yeah, I was sitting right here. It was nice. It's a good, it was a nice spot. I like my seat. But we'll take this and we'll go. I talk with Justin all the time about worship, okay? And you have a favorite worship song. But the only reason you have a favorite worship song probably isn't because of the theological meaning behind the song. It's probably because you had an emotional connection to that song. And though therefore, when you have emotional connection to that song, it locks you in. It could be the dumbest worship song on the planet, but if you had an emotional connection to it, it is your favorite and everybody else can go pound sand, okay? And if you don't play it every week, I'm going to be mad at you, okay? <laughs> It's this emotional connection. That is the only reason why we still have country music, y'all. <laughs> Some of you are offended by that. I apologize. Okay. But let's just be real. What is country music? It really it, it pulls on an emotional um, attachment to something. So if I'm going to talk about a truck, a car, or a dog, right? Or a wife or a girlfriend or whatever they sing about, right? then it obviously pulls an emotional connection with you. And therefore, if it's got a catchy tune, an emotional connection, we do it. So what happens? In life, there are things that we have an emotional connection to. And we will not let it go. And so we've created words like it's nostalgic. That way I can hang on to it and not seem weird. Anybody still have their blankie from when they were 12 or like or 5? 12. <laughs> from like 5? Why do I still have this blankie? It brings me no comfort, nothing. But I have an emotional connection to the blankie, to the teddy bear, to these love letters that were written in junior high and I don't know why they're still in my closet. Right? I have an emotional connection to it. And now we have shows called Hoarders. Because <laughs> there's something in their, in their beans where they just can't let things go. Why? I'm just trying to prove to you that we not only are creatures of habit, but we don't like change. So I want to walk this through with you guys. And I, this is a, um, as, I, as I move into like the sermon today, I, I want to just be like real with you guys. Um, I really just kind of want to give you my heart this morning. And in this series, I just kind of want to share my heart through um, um, just kind of what God's kind of sharing with me and what I've seen in the last year and just what, where God, I, I believe, is going in the year to come. And I just kind of want to share my heart uh, with you guys. So if it does seem a little jumbled and that type of stuff, just know it's pastor trying to give his heart to you. Amen. Are we okay with that? Yeah, we're good? Yeah? Okay. So here were my thoughts. When I started coming up with this, here was my, here was my first thought that I came up with. Um, as life moves forward... It is inevitable that change occurs. Look at how the world has changed just in the last 25 years. Change happens, yet scripture stays the same, and so does God. You find that in Hebrews 18, chapter 3. Or, chapter 18, verse 3. Um, so why do we consistently find ourselves trying to make church and the scripture relevant for today? We shouldn't be trying to make God relevant to our society, but rather making society relevant to God. Did that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. This is why um, a couple weeks ago I used um, uh, A.W. Tozer's quote that said this, in case you missed it. It says, the world isn't waiting on a new definition of Christianity. They're waiting on a new demonstration of Christianity. It goes along with this idea that the church shouldn't have to change because society is changing. If God is the same, the scriptures are the same, and he's the same today as he is tomorrow and all these other things, then the reality is we need to kind of focus in on what God is doing, not have God focus in on what I'm trying to do. 
Did that make sense? Because this is going to be where we're going to head in this idea of the pivot. Because listen, things start to change. And when things start to change, like society and that, um, we need to start adapting with it. The problem for a church, the biggest problem we have as a church is this. Just look around the room. We have a lot of different generations in here. A lot. Some people in this room might remember when the remote control came out. <laughs> right? It had a cable. And it, and, and, and it had a cable. This is news to me. That's awesome, okay? It had a cable. Some people in this room don't even remember 9-11 because they weren't born yet. To them, it's just something they read about in a history book. Some of you remember when the internet came out and all those pretty noises that came with it. We remember these things. Some of us remember when it was the first home computer, a cellular telephone. Not a cell phone, cellular. Tell, okay? Listen, trying to span the gap of all these generations, it's hard because we get set in our ways. And I can prove this just real quick by this. It happened to me this week, and I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but this is what happened. I, I was taking uh, some people, um, my parents, um, they wanted, they, they didn't want, they needed new cell phones. This is a day of terror for them. Let's just be real. If you're an older generation, getting a new phone is like, trying to recreate the internet. It's, it, in their minds, this is, this is such a hard thing. Why? Because when you have that phone, you've had it for so long, you know exactly how the phone works. You don't have to learn anything new. There's nothing, it's just, you get set in your ways. You just kind of, there it is, that's what it is. And when that starts to break, you're like, fix it. No, why don't you get a new one? I don't want a new one. <laughs> fix that, because I know how this one works, right? And so for them, going to get them new cell phones was like, oh no, this is gonna be horrible, this is gonna be dreadful. If I was gonna take anybody else that was not their generation to get a new cell phone, it is the day of joy. <laughs> I get the new iPhone, whatever, or the new Android, whatever. Woo! This is awesome! You know, and it's like, yeah! They're super excited. But the older generation is, no. Please, dear Jesus, no. Do you guys get the difference? Sometimes the older we get, we want things to be a little bit simpler. And we do the same thing with church. That's why we need to start learning the art of the pivot. Because a pivot is not change. And let me explain why. Pivot, this is uh, how you define it. Pivot, to oscillate, which means swing back and forth while connected to a central point um, or foundation. It also means, I did not know this, so I threw this in there as extra. It also means a person or thing that plays a central part of an activity or organization. That's right, you can be a pivot. Right? So this is a dual meaning that we have here. The first one is you have to get this. It oscillates, which means swings back and forth. And the best thing that I could think about is this, an anchor. An anchor, when you drop anchor into the sea or the river or wherever, it hits the bottom, it hits a foundation, it connects to something. And then once it connects, it becomes part of the foundation and it just sways. Whatever's tethered to it just sways back and forth, right? Never once leaving the foundation. It is the central point. The question that I'm going to have for you today is very simple. What is your foundation. What are you tethered to? Is your anchor in Christ or not? It's really that simple, isn't it? It either is or it isn't. And when you started this, I had a thought process to this. I, I said this in my head. I said, we need to start learning the art of the pivot. Understanding that we are anchored in Christ, even though the world may make us sway in many different directions, we are still connected and grounded in our Lord, even when storms may come our way. Amen? Amen? Amen. So what does this mean? It means this. It doesn't matter what generation that you're in. 
Christ doesn't change. The scripture doesn't change. What happens in your life does not affect God. We have to understand that. We want it to. We want to sit down and be like, God, I feel angry right now. All this bad stuff is happening to me. You should be angry too. You should be, you know what? Smite all those people that are coming after me. And God's like, uh, don't I care about them too? Don't you talk to me like that, God. And we have these weird conversations with God because that's what we want. The problem is that means our foundation is in ourselves and not actually in him. And we need to ask the question, where is our true foundation? I'm going to be real with y'all. I'm not giving you answers today. I just have a bunch of questions. And it's something, <laughs> yay. I really want us to take this to heart. Because if we're going to go anywhere in 2020, if we're going to be the people God has called us to be in 2020, we need to know first and foremost, where is our anchor? Because only then can we start to pivot. Only then can we start to move around and start to say, okay, I can go over here. If God has asked me to be a missionary, I can go be a missionary for this time being. Why? Because it doesn't mean that you're going to be a missionary always. It just means that God needs somebody to do that. And if you're willing to say yes, guess what you are? Amen. You're a missionary today. Maybe he's like, hey, I need somebody to go talk to that person and pray for that person. That, that one person that's over by the corner by themselves. Well, God, you should send somebody. <laughs> you know what? I'll pray for them over here and God's like no I need you to be my mouthpiece right now and then you got to pivot you're not changing you're just pivoting now you're a mouthpiece for God and you're going to share maybe you're going to have an opportunity this year to share your testimony and you're going to get to preach but you're like that's not my gifting it is when he says it is we so, we, we so badly put ourselves in these little holes because we're so afraid of change. We need to be a people, a church, if you will, that understands that we can pivot. And pivot it doesn't actually mean I have to change everything. Why? Nothing changes. I'm grounded in Him. I'm grounded in Him. I'm anchored, if you will. I want to share um, from Galatians today. And the reason I want to share from Galatians is because Paul is trying to teach um, the church in Galatians how to pivot. He's trying to teach them what it looks like to pivot. Not to change, but to actually just pivot. And here's why they have to pivot. I'll share this with you. Um, uh, Galatians, uh, the Galatian people, if you will, come from Galatia. And I just, I brought this little map thing so you guys can see this. That's Galatia. It's the green one right there up in the center. Uh, if you guys look around down here in the red, is Jerusalem to kind of give you the Mediterranean seas right there, the Black Seas up there. And because you guys live nowhere near this, you probably don't care. Okay? But the reality is, this is what it kind of looks like. You have Ephesus over here, which you guys get the Ephesians from, right? Um, you have Tarsus, which is there, which is is where uh, Paul uh, kind of hangs out for a long time. And anyways, these are kind of just the things that you can see. If you were to put a map up today, this is where Galatia would be today. It's basically Turkey. Now, the maps are like white and blue, and like you can't say, but the Mediterranean Sea is there. Russia's up there. You got to have Saudi Arabia, Egypt, all that. Now, if you go to Greece, after Greece, you have Italy, and then you have all of Europe. Everybody with me on this one? Why is it important to know that? Because if you want to get over to Israel, if you want to get to the, to the Middle East, you have to go through Turkey. You have to go through Galatia at that time period too. Are you guys walking with me in this one? So you have to be able to go through that. If you have to be able to go through that, there's a lot of trading going on. Which means there's a lot of people coming in and out of Galatia. And there's a lot of people traveling and they're all, they all have an opinion. Basically, the best way I can give you an analogy for this, Galatia at the time was social media. Everybody has an opinion. Everybody just comes and goes when they please. And you don't know what's right or wrong. You just kind of go with it. Paul shows up. And when Paul shows up, he gives the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he shares with them the love of Christ. That Jesus Christ came to die for their sins. That his blood covers, their, uh, covers all their transgressions. 
and that he didn't stay dead, but he rose three days later. And that you have the, have the Holy Spirit, God, inside of you. The Galatian people accepted this word. Evangelism started like crazy um, in, in Galatia. But then all of a sudden, word gets back to Paul that they're not preaching the gospel that he gave. It was a mixed view of the gospel. And in Galatia one, or Galatians chapter 1, this is what it says. I want to read it to you guys. It says this, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory uh, forever and ever. Amen? Amen? Basically, it's a greeting. He's basically saying, hey guys, what's up? Hey, remember that stuff that I talked to you about how God rescued you from uh, uh, evil and he rescued you from sin and all this kind of stuff? I just want to point that out in my, in my saying hi, just to remind you who I am. You guys following that? And then he goes on, he says this, verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we are an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. As we have already said now, and I say it again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than, the, uh, other than what you accepted, then let them be under God's curse. Ugh. Did you guys know that God curses people? That's a new one, right? Because what happens is we come to church and all you hear about church is like the fluffy unicorn rainbow Jesus, right? Where he's like happy all the time and he throws glitter. I don't know what your image of Jesus is. But, but like we get into this place where it's like he's, he's so loving, he's so caring, he's so this. I love my children, but sometimes i got to put my foot down. And I will still love my children in the midst of me putting my foot down and saying no because I want to help my children understand what they need to know. Yes? yes? So then in this case, God has to do the same thing sometimes. But I was sitting there and I was like, it's super weird because why would God curse somebody? What is he trying to say? And then I realized the different gospel that he's preaching actually isn't so different. It's actually the law. See, what happened is is there are Jewish people that understood the law, which is your, uh, which is your Torah, your first, for the first five books of the Bible. You, you know, I know you guys memorize Leviticus, but yeah, all of Leviticus. It's all of this law, and he says, and this is what they're preaching. They're saying, yes, Jesus came. Yes, he, he died for your sins. But the only way you get to heaven is through doing good works. The problem is, is some of you are like, wait, that's wrong? Because if we're honest, and I, you have to be honest with yourself. How many times have you gone and had to go do something good because you felt like it would please God? You don't have to please God, but God by doing good. That's not how you please God. That's not it at all. That, if you have that mindset, that's still under the law. God came to destroy that. He came and said this, I'm fulfilling the law. Everything is fulfilled. The law is fulfilled. I took, best way I can describe it to you, you guys ready? You broke the law. The cops come to your house, right? And the love of your life steps in and says, I'm the one that did it. And they arrest her and take her away or him away instead of you. Do you think that's fair? And you're like, hey, that's messed up. No, no, no. I need to be in that place. And that's what we get. That's the love of God. He stepped in for you. The law is fulfilled. Why? Because you, you guys, have you ever heard the word double jeopardy? You can't be charged twice for the exact same thing, right? Same thing in God's world. You can't be charged twice for the sins that you've already committed and, and already done. You can't be done. And it's already been taken care of. Amen. Does that make sense? Everybody, everybody still, Yes. I'm trying to make this super easy for you guys to understand. This is, what the, this is what Paul was preaching. The problem is, even though we know about Christ, we still feel like we're under the law. 
You sin and you walk around thinking how horrible of a person you are and how much that, that God hates you now because you sinned. That's law-based. I'm not telling you you get to go willy-nilly into, I don't know where willy-nilly came from, but you get to go, like, <laughs> just go off and just sin all you want. That's not, what this, that's not what it says. But it says this, you're forgiven. Do you know why he did it? Why Jesus did it? So that you can have freedom. Man, how hard, I mean, let's just be real. How hard is it? How depressing is it if you just walk around all day thinking how horrible of a person you are? Consistently being bombarded that I am, I, am, I am no good. I can never be good in God's eyes. That's law based. And the reason I have to point this out is because I feel like some of you, that's where your anchor is. Your anchor is still stuck in the law. And it's not in the holiness and righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because God says this, I know that you screwed up and I washed it away. Now can we have a relationship please? There is nothing in your way. You don't have to feel bad about anything you've done or will do. I'm going to love you no matter what. And you know what? To prove my love to you, I went to a cross. I rose from the grave and I put myself inside of you. Most people, they think of the cross and they get the cross idea and they understand the blood, but they forget a pivotal moment. Jesus rose from the grave, gave us power to what? To beat death, but how did he do it? By putting himself in us. Martin Luther King Jr., when you guys saw that video or heard that video, right? What did he say? I was sitting there, I was at the end of my rope, I was bending over this coffee cup and I heard it, that inner voice that whispered to me. Stand up. That is God. It's the Holy Spirit inside of us. And every single one of you that accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has it. Now the question becomes, what do you do with it? You listen. You listen. What do I need to do? And ready? If you're grounded in Him, you do whatever He says. It doesn't matter what I have to do, I'm going to do it. This is, what it. this is the way that we should be living our lives. Anyways, the verse goes on. Or the, excuse me, the, the passage goes on. It says this, verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I'm going to say that last part one more time because I think it's pivotal that we listen to this. If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Jesus Christ. So many of us, including myself, don't think I'm pointing blame on anybody. We get to this place where we try to please people instead of Him. So we shut our mouth instead of saying what we believe. We won't pray with people because we don't want to offend them or we don't know a God that they serve. We tiptoe around certain subjects and we tiptoe around certain things or won't say certain things. Why? Because we're afraid to offend somebody. If I'm, if I'm afraid to offend you, that means I'm trying to please you. And if I'm trying to please you, then I'm offending my God. I don't know where you want to stand, but at the end of the day, I hope that you would stand with Jesus Christ. What is the purpose of the gospel? To share the good news that you've been forgiven. To share the good news that death no longer has a hold on you. The good news that God dwells in you and you and Him will be together forever for eternity. Hence the word forever, but this is the good news. The problem is, do you accept it? And if you do, what does your life look like? What does your life look like? Because if it doesn't match the scriptures, then something needs to change. If you're not trying to become righteous and holy, which means set apart, then you need to change. And I'm using the right word. Because if you don't have Christ as your anchor, you need to change. Only when you have Christ as your anchor can you then pivot within what he's asking you to do. Does that make sense? 
But in order for you to get there, you have to know where is your anchor. Is your anchor still in yourself? I mean, you come to church, you sit in church, you, you love church, you, you say you love God, but if your life doesn't reflect it, if you're not trying for righteousness and you're not trying for holiness, like I stated, then where is your anchor really? Is it just trying to make you feel better? Because then your anchor is in yourself. There's still pride there. We need to get rid of that. Listen. The whole reason I'm bringing all of this up and the reason we're talking about the pivot is because I believe in 2020 we as the church, you as individuals, you're going to be put to the test. You can see it in society already bubbling up and, and, and already starting, like, I mean, just open social media. Everybody's yelling at everybody. Nobody has joy anymore. And so the reality starts to become, for you, where do you stand? Where is your anchor? Because the storms will come. The waves will come. And if you're not anchored into the, if you're not anchored into the foundation that is Christ, you're just going to get blown all over the place. And I'll be honest with you, some of you, that's what happened in 2019. Stuff hit the fan. It got crazy in your life. Relationships blew up. Maybe jobs blew up. And all of a sudden, your little boat just gets tossed and torn all over the place. And maybe coming into 2020, you're looking back and you're saying, where, did I, where am I? What happened to me? And it's because you didn't have your anchor down. And maybe today God's asking you the question, are you ready to put your anchor in me? Are you ready to be unmovable? Are you guys talking with me? You guys got really quiet, so I'm just assuming that you're following along and not super bored, okay? And if you're super bored, I apologize. It's not what it is. But I'm here to please God anyway. So... <laughs> So the reality has just become, I'm asking you this question because I want, I want to challenge you. What does your life look like? Because in order for us to master the art of the pivot, we need to know where our anchor is first. We need to know what foundation we're actually connected to. What is our center point? If you guys read the rest of Galatians, which I'm going to challenge you to do in a second, but if you read the rest of Galatians, what you're going to find out is that Paul is charging the Galatians with one thought process. You spend too much time worried about the law and too little time worried about the Spirit. And he challenges them, start to live by the Spirit. The law is already taken care of. Start to live by the Spirit. What does living like the Spirit look like? It's the fruit of the Spirit, which you'll read in Galatians chapter 5. Peace, joy, love, all that kind of stuff. This is how the church and God's people should be marked. By living by the Spirit. So the question today. Where's your anchor? What is your foundation? Second thing I want to do is I want to give you homework. And some of you are like, ah, I've been out of school for a long time. Or some of you are like, I hate this place now. Um, here's your homework. Read Galatians. Now that you have an understanding of what Galatians is about, read it. See what pops out for you. Read it. Actually, just take, it's only six chapters long. It's not a very long book, okay? And it's, it's, it's really not that hard to understand unless you own a King James Bible, and then we can talk. But, um, but it's really not that hard. If, you, if your Bible is hard to understand, get an easier Bible. You're like, how does that work? It's just a different translation. Find one that works for you. But most of us, because we don't like change, what happens is we go to read this, right? And we just like... We get frustrated because like, I don't understand it and we toss it and that means the whole thing is bad. Most of you, if you're in a, in, in a different generation, I ask you to read and you're like, yay! And then there's another generation in this room where you're like, is there a video I can watch? Audio something? 
It's the truth, right? I'm not saying it to be funny. I'm saying it because it's the real thing. We've lost the idea of what God's trying to do, which is his word doesn't change. But if I can get a generation of people not to read anymore, the enemy gets a foothold. Challenge yourself. Read his word. Here's what I want you to do. And, 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 and this is my thing to you. Read the book of Galatians this week. From tomorrow to next Sunday, there are going to be six days. There's only six chapters. Read a chapter a day. If you start reading and you read something that literally makes no sense to you, write it down. Have like a three by five card next to you. Have your, your phone open to your notes, whatever. However, whatever generation you are, okay? And write it down. See, this doesn't make sense to me. And then keep reading. If something else doesn't make sense in that chapter, write it down. And then what I want you to do is this. Go to somebody that you trust in the church and ask a question. Hey, I was reading Galatians, and it said this, and I don't understand it. Can you help me? And if they don't know, you bring your questions to me on Sunday. And after service, I will walk through every question that you have in Galatians. And I hope I have the answer. I'm not saying that I will. I'm just saying that I, be, I will still listen. Okay? But here's the thing. Ask. This is how the, the church is supposed to be. This is how the church is supposed to function. You have questions. We have answers. Right, we're going to figure it out together. Either way, this is how we need to operate. Everybody got it? Yes. So read the book of Galatians. Live by the Spirit. Chase after more righteousness, uh, chase after righteousness and holiness like God asked us to be. If you're living in the law, stop living in the law. If you feel bad about yourself consistently, then let's have a conversation because you don't need to live like that. God comes to give you freedom. He comes to give you peace. He also comes to challenge you though. So today, where's your anchor? The first part of this series, find your foundation. What are you connected to? And be honest with yourself. Amen? Amen. So Father God, as we get into worship right now, I'm going to ask, Lord, that your presence would be here and that we would recognize you, Father God, that we, we would feel you, see you, hear you. Let us have a moment with you in this place right now, Father. And God, I pray that everybody in here would have their anchor in you. And God, if they're not in you, would you tell them where and how and have them change it, Father God? Unless they don't want to, because God, you're a loving God and you don't force yourself on anybody. But God, if there's anybody in here that needs to have their foundation in you, God, let them give that this morning. Let them chase you once again, or for the first time. God, we love you. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your resurrection. And thank you, Father God, for always being with me, never leaving me, and never forsaking me.
praises of a thousand generations you are worthy lord of all and unto you slain and risen king we lift our voice with heaven singing worthy lord of all
And unto you, the slain and risen King, we lift our voice with heaven, singing worthy, Lord of all, Lord of all. Lord of all, 
Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah. Christ is risen. Bow down, bow down, yeah, yeah. Bow down before He, yeah. For He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah. Born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasures you found God, I thank you that you never leave us You never forsake us I don't care what our past looks like God, I thank you that you are a God that cares about our present and our future and Lord, that you take our past, Lord, and, and those moments that were not of you, Lord, you say you cast them as far as the east is from the west. God, that they are no longer a thought process to you when we repent and when we ask for forgiveness. And God, that we are covered by the blood of the Lamb, Lord, that causes us to move forward in our lives. God, my prayer is that we would not be stuck in what you've already let go of. <laughs> God, will we not hold ourselves in bondage? It's so easy sometimes to blame the enemy. The enemy is doing this. But God, would we let go? God, if, if that is the pivot that some of us need to make this year, would we pivot? Would we recognize where our anchor is held in you <laughs> and move forward as you say? God, we glorify you. We praise you. We honor you. Not just for what you've done, but for who you are. Would we be present in this moment as I know your presence is here? We glorify you, God. Oh, how high would I climb mountains if the mountains were where you hide? Oh, how far I'd scale the valley If you graced the other side Oh, how long I've chased the rivers From lowly seas to where they rise Against the rush of grace descending From the source of its Cause in the highlands and the heartache You're neither more or less inclined I would search and stop at nothing You're just not that hard to find Oh, I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains in my heart. You're the sun in where my feet are. I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadow. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same Oh, oh, oh Oh, 
how far beneath your glory does your kindness extend the path from where your feet rest on the sunrise to where you sweep the sinner's path and oh how fast would you come running if just a shadow be through the night chase my steps through all my failures and walk me out the other side for who can dare ascend that mountain that valley hill called calvary but for the one I call good shepherd who like a lamb was slain for me oh I will praise you on the mountain I will praise you in the mountains and mountains you're the summit where my feet are I will praise you in the valleys all the same no less God within the shadow, no less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is, in the highlands in the heartache all the same. Oh, oh, oh. Whatever, whatever I walk through, wherever I Wherever I stand, and if ever I walk through the valley of death, I sing through the shadow my song of ascent. Whatever I walk through, wherever I am, will end to move the mountain. Wherever I stand, and if ever I walk through the valley of death. I sing through the shadow my song of a sin, my song of a sin. Whoa, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. my song of a sin. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. from the gravest of all valleys. Comes the pastures we call grace, a mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave. Come, I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the summit where my feet are. I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadow. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. Oh. Oh, in the highlands and the heartache all the same. Oh, oh, oh. Say, I will praise you on the mountain. I will praise you in the mountains in my way. You're the summit where my feet are. I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadow. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. You know, uh, as we were uh, worshiping, um, 
few people had words and uh, just some things that like the Lord was speaking to them. And one of the reoccurring themes in the words was very simple. Um, in order to be anchored, I mean, it sounds like a dust statement, but you have to actually be plugged in. You have to be anchored to something. And how do you get anchored? I think that's the biggest question. How, how do you know that you're plugged into Christ? How do you know that you're anchored in God? Well, the big telltale will, will be your lifestyle. But the second thing is how do you stay connected? It's through his word. It's through prayer. It's through church. Church meaning community. It's through these things. God has given us a bunch of avenues to stay connected to him. But he will never force you into it. He will let you make that decision. And, and just so you know, there's also a force at work that, that doesn't want you to make good decisions. It's going to constantly keep telling you the wrong thing to do. My hope and my, and my, my prayer for you is that when those moments come, you make the right decisions. You fight yourself and say, I'm going to read God's word. You fight and say, I'm going to pray. You fight and say, I got to get to church. I got to be in community with, with, with like my friends, my, my family. And watch what God does with you. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.